Welcome, everyone. I'm John Bridgeland, co-founder and CEO of the COVID Collaborative, and I'd like to thank our co-hosts today, Derek Johnson of the NAACP, Janet Merguia of Unidos US, and Fawn Sharp and Yvette Rubido of the National Congress of American Indians. Together, we are all extremely excited to welcome the wonderful Dr. Marcella Nunez-Smith to our March Fireside Chat. Dr. Nunez-Smith is Senior Advisor to the White House COVID-19 Response Team and Chair of the U.S. COVID-19 Health Equity Task Force. She is also Associate Dean for Health Equity Research, Associate Professor of Medicine, Public Health and Management, and Director of the Equity Research and Innovation Center at Yale. Her research focuses on health and healthcare equity for marginalized populations, with an emphasis on the social and structural determinants of health, the influence of healthcare systems on health disparities, and the advancement of community academic partnered scholarship. Originally from the US Virgin Islands, she attended Jefferson Medical College, did a res residency at Harvard's Brigham and, Young, uh, Brigham and Women's Hospital, and had a fellowship at the Yale Robert Wood Johnson Foundation Clinical Scholars Program. We're all so grateful for all she's doing for our country. To moderate our discussion today, we have our co-chairs, former Republican mayor, governor, US Senator, and US Secretary of the Interior, Dirk Kempthorne of Idaho, and former governor, civil rights activist, business entrepreneur, and presidential candidate, Deval Patrick of Massachusetts. I'd also like to thank our co-founders, Ray Chambers and Michelle Williams, our president, Gary Edson, science advisor, Stephen Phillips, and Anjali, Tammy, and Dan, and Sharice for their hard work on this program today, and all of our partners for the common mission and shared work. After a moderated discussion with Dr. Nunez-Smith, and we're gonna keep this very informal, we will be taking initial questions from our, our co-hosts and then turn to the audience. So please submit your questions uh, through the uh, comment box um, and over to you, Governor Patrick, for the first question. Bridge, thank you very much. And thank you all for joining us today for uh, this really important conversation with this really important leader, uh, Dr. Nunez Smith. It's just an honor uh, to have you with us today. And I know you've done a lot of these. But this is a way that we, through the COVID Collaborative, can contribute to uh, getting good information out to as many people uh, as possible. And we thank you for joining and for your service. Um, just to kick it off, we've known since early days that for a variety of reasons, Black and Brown Americans and seniors are among the hardest hit by COVID-19. But as the distribution plans have rolled out for the vaccine, um, in many states, most prioritized seniors. There was hardly any mention of black and brown citizens as a part of the strategy uh, for getting distribution, uh, getting the vaccine out. Talk about the best strategy for ensuring that distribution is fair. Great, well, thank you and hello everyone. Let me just off the top say, so grateful to be here in conversation with you today. I wanna thank COVID Collaborative, of course, as well as the co-host and the fabulous audience that is here joining us. Um, the work that everyone is doing is just critically important and getting the good information out as you say, Governor. You know, absolutely. I think everybody who is in the audience um, knows the statistics. They are um, somber in terms of the disproportionate impact on particular communities, including older adults, as well as communities of color and, and others, rural communities, et cetera. And so, you know, important for us to, to also anchor not just in the numbers, but in the lived realities of people who are disproportionately affected, as we often say, and, you know, to recognize that the grief, the suffering, the economic worry is also disproportionately influencing particular communities. And so this question of how to be sure that we are fair and equitable in all COVID-19 resource distribution. And, and I know, and I'm grateful for us to lean into vaccination today, but we have to keep in mind too, things like PPE, um, you know, and President Biden announced a plan to send millions of masks to food pantries, um, as well as community health centers. We still need masks, right? One message that I wanna make sure everybody hears today, we know the public health things that work. We also know that testing works as long as tracing, right? So we also need resources there, treatments. And we also, thankfully, the scientific discovery that's brought us vaccines, we also have many therapies for COVID-19. Mm -hmm. Yet still, we see that the uptake has not been equitable to date. So keeping our eye on all the COVID-19 resources, including vaccine, which is so promising, we are at such a hopeful moment now. But it is important to look in the rearview mirror and say, well, how, how did we get here? And so 
You know, exactly. The CDC has an advisory group, the ACIP, that makes recommendations as to who should get prioritized for vaccine. I am incredibly grateful. Let me take a moment and say to all the scientists who are independent, ACIP, the FDA advisory who reviews the science around mm -hmm. vaccines, you know, as well as the National Academies for Medicine, um, Science and Engineering, they also have spoken to this question of equitable vaccine distribution. Mm -hmm. And so, mm -hmm. At the end of the day, we know that it is going to be a partnership. Most of the vaccines go to our states, local jurisdictions, tribes and territories. Um, and it is really up to us as well um, and the federal government through our channels to think about how, how to, to prioritize. Um, most certainly, we, we know that the majority of, uh, of lost lives to COVID-19 occurred in older Americans. Um, I'm going to get in trouble for older 65 um, because uh, that is the new 40. But certainly we know that age is the strongest predictor. And uh, so I think it is really key to think about both who is at risk for severe complication from COVID-19 and who is at high risk of exposure. And we saw kind of ACIP walk that line with saying older adults, but also think of essential workers not too far behind. And yeah. we've just seen a patchwork in terms of how that's been implemented. So yeah. I would say, you know, there are equity metrics to your point, um, mm -hmm. things like the social vulnerability index for us to look at zip code to mm -hmm. target. And I think that's one of the key things that we can do is be mm -hmm. sure that we take that place-based approach to vaccine availability. That's something we're doing and modeling in the federal channels. Okay, thank you. Dr. Nunez Smith, um, <clears throat> it is indeed a great pleasure to, to visit with you like this in this forum. Let's address the trust of government. Uh, the CDC, the FDA, FDA, they've been sadly inconsistent during this crisis. We could go on and on about that, together with other spokespeople on behalf of government. You combine that with the heated political discourse by politicians, even the media, it has created an environment where people have expressed strong distrust of government. You are now the government. How do you gain back that very fragile thing called trust by so many disparate communities in America. Absolutely, thank you. I'm also grateful for, for that question. You know, that is goal one of President Biden's national strategy, right, is rebuilding trust. I mean, and, and even in our conversations, we often say, you know, that's one, two, and three. Um, it's just imperative that we do that. You are, of course, correcting your, um, in the observation. And, and we, we can even see this across you know, political spectrum. I, I do think that it is, um, I'm saddened by how politicized this is. You know, I am a physician, I'm a researcher, not a politician. And, you know, I see this as a public health emergency. Uh, and the fact that we now have gotten so politicized around things that are just fundamental to public health, fundamental to keeping ourselves safe, our families safe, our communities safe, uh, it, it's incredibly sad. But, you know, as the president has said, this is important. And so how do you do it? You first commit to being very data-driven, and we are being guided by evidence, by science. Um, you commit to being honest, to being transparent. So saying what we know, when we know it, what we don't know. Um, uh, important words often, as I say to my med students, right? Don't make it up. We just say we don't know, right? And so that, I think, is a critical part of rebuilding the trust. Um, acknowledging, right, the distrust, which has often and for many communities, particularly those communities that are minoritized and marginalized, you know, trust has been um, uh, lost and squandered and distrust has been earned. Right? And so we have to make that acknowledgement as well. And then we have to show up. So we say things like, you know, we're going to make sure that people have access to vaccination, that we're going to launch a vaccination campaign. It's vaccination, not vaccines that save lives, that we follow through on that, right? And that we take a posture. I always say um, we have to be humble in this work. Communities know what they need. We need to listen and learn from them. So it is imperative and it's all hands on deck, but it is a core priority of this administration to start, meet people where they are, and try to rebuild trust. I wanted to, uh, I want to just continue on this issue of trust, if I may. Um, in a lot of communities facing inequities, as we were just talking about earlier, black and brown communities, um, uh, indigenous tribal lands, uh, the hesitancy around uh, a COVID-19 vaccine is, is, is rooted. It has, uh, it has a reason. 
Um, and it's rooted in generational trauma and distrust of the healthcare system um, or of government, as, uh, as Governor Kempthorne was asking about. As, as we work to encourage vaccine uptake, what are you seeing um, as breaking through, really reaching uh, people who, uh, all of whom need to be reached? Absolutely. Thank you for that question. You know, it is for the vaccination campaign to be successful, just to lift up your last point, right? Everyone needs to be reached. We have to make sure that, you know, both vaccine access as well as acceptance and confidence are, are high in, in the country. Um, and there are many, many groups that unfortunately um, have experience both with the, the government, the federal government, uh, as well as with healthcare institutions um, of experiencing that systematic bias uh, and discrimination. And I think only to echo generational trauma, yes. And also the contemporary realities. I say for many, many people have a, a chance. One of, the, one of the things that brings me the most joy about the roles with the federal administration is, is getting to talk to so many people about their perspectives and experiences and hosting stakeholder roundtables and conversations at, at the White House with just key groups, many that you just listed. And for a lot of people, sadly, there are contemporary examples as well. Right? And so people will be able to talk about trying to get healthcare last week I or think. their family member or neighbor last week and, um, and, and receiving or, or feeling as though they experienced subpar care. Um, so you, know, you have to be intentional equity never happens by default. So it is about determining those best and promising practices to reach out to people. The first thing I think in terms of the principle for, for how do we talk to, to people who still have questions, right, about vaccination and the vaccine specifically, you know, is meeting them where they are and saying it is important that you have questions and that you get them asked and answered by people that you know and trust. As I often say, you know, if you're having chest pain and a heart attack, you're probably not going to go to social media in order to figure out what to do next, right? So lean on who you know has that expertise, right? People in the healthcare professions, for example, to get those questions asked and answered. Um, and also just the, some of that key information we touched on a little bit earlier. It's so critical that people know the process of the vaccination development. This mm. isn't something that started and stopped within some you know, one year period. The, the science has been in process for decades. Um, understanding to the diversity that we have now that perhaps we didn't always in terms of representation in the scientists who are working on the vaccines and vaccine development, the scientists who are reviewing the data as that FDA process that I mentioned before. You know, there is diversity and representation in the clinical trials themselves. We have over 30% of clinical trial participants identify as people of color in those late phase clinical trials. So just making sure that information is out there as well as knowing they work, all three vaccines, are highly, highly efficacious against the things we care about most. Um, that's severe illness, hospitalization, and death. And on top of that now, you know, so many people tell me they're like, I don't want to be the first. And I'm like, do you know, we already made a hundred million? <laughs> like, <laughs> You are not the first. And so it's really key that we get that out there that millions of people across the country have been vaccinated and the vaccines are, are safe. And being able to just speak to the questions people have. And so not presuming, saying, what question do you have? And speaking to that directly. But I know that I feel very, very grateful. I've been vaccinated. Um, and the family members I have who are eligible have been vaccinated. And it's just personally, I know, so important because I want to keep my family safe. That's great. Thank you. Doctor, we talk about racial inequity when it comes to vaccinations. But what about geographic inequity? <laughs> there appears to be an increasing inequity between shots in the arms of people living in the urban areas and, and far fewer shots in the arms of people living in rural areas, such as in my home state of Idaho, yeah. which can often include pharmacy deserts. Yes. Uh, we're also seeing some of the highest rates of vaccine hesitancy among many conservatives and, Republic and Republicans. So two questions. Uh, one, what are your strategies for ensuring equitable access to vaccines for people living in the rural areas, the territories, on tribal lands. I know you've gone door to door in some neighborhoods, but in these areas, it can take you hours to go door to door. And then what are your strategies for reaching conservatives and Republicans and significantly young Republicans? Thank you for both. just writing them down. Okay. <laughs> so, 
How's so, your handwriting, doctor? Terrible, <laughs> as, as you could expect. It is Absolutely. not pretty. <laughs> So, doctors do not have good handwriting. <laughs> they do not teach us handwriting. Um, so I appreciate uh, both parts. And so, you know, I will start with um, with the question around geography, which is so important. So, you know, I, I encourage people, if, if you have a hard time falling asleep at night, you know, to take a look at the national strategy for the COVID-19 response and recovery. Um, you know, goal six speaks directly to this issue. And so the top line there is around making sure that we are attending to the inequities we've seen in, in race, ethnicity, and racial ethnic disparities, but also specifically rurality. And so that is just top line for goal six. So every conversation um, that I'm in or every conversation that the team has, you know, we begin by thinking of those groups. And we know, I have to acknowledge here that many, many groups have been hard hit and you know, if you give me a chance, I'll go on a, on a little side um, discourse about data and where our data are and what our data needs might be and how we don't have full visibility into really the range of everyone's experience, um, quite frankly. But we do know that often race and place are, are the largest determinants of health in our country. And so leaning very much into place, thinking about place-based approaches going to be key. And that's what we're doing with the federal uh, channels. And so to be really clear in terms of vaccine and allocation, the bulk goes to the states. We know, you know, states, local jurisdictions, tribes and territories, you know, are going to be the best suited to form partnerships on the ground to get people vaccinated. Um, and in a very synergistic way, we have stood up additional federal channels um, to bring additional vaccine into communities. So we have launched within the first three weeks, President Biden launched several new initiatives in that federal program. And each one of those takes a place-based approach. We're making sure that we get to rural communities. You know, the pharmacy desert piece is one. We know 90% of Americans live within five miles of a pharmacy, but 10% of Americans are a lot. And many of them are in rural America. We still know that five miles can be far when you don't have a car or another way to get there. So the pharmacy deserts are real and we have to be aware of vaccination deserts. And so when we think about, you know, the federal strategies that we've taken, standing up these community vaccination centers, they're not just mass vax. Thanks to the great colleagues at FEMA, VA, DOD, we can stand up smaller pop-up ones that we do often in collaboration to get to mobile. These large mass vac sites have mobile units that are part of them often in a hub and spoke way. That's what we have to do. We have to bring vaccine to people, absolutely. And so when we think about community health centers, that's one of the federal programs and channels. That's another way to get to our rural neighbors. Um, you know, the many, many, Patients of community health centers live in rural areas and zip codes. And so we have to, it's not, I agree, you know, it can't be just one strategy. It's going to be multi-pronged. We're going to be intentional. We're partnering at the federal level. I had a wonderful conversation with 30 of my new best friends who came together for a rural town, uh, the sort of round table um, a couple of weeks back with great insights about ways to partner to get vaccine to people. Um, so that's just the answer to the first question. And so, but if I if I may to speak a little to the to the second, um, just briefly around, you know, how do we make sure that we're connecting with everyone? And you know, I've already spoken to um, to the sad reality of how politics have have gotten into this. But the reality, we we have to get to everybody. We have to get to everybody where they are. And whether you know, one of the things um, that I that I often say is, no matter who we're trying to get to, some of the principles remain the same. So one is like, what is the message? It has to be tailored. You know, this goes back to what questions do you have? What are your concerns? One person might be concerned about, you know, trust in government and somebody else might be concerned about fertility or something. So how do we make sure that the message is tailored in that way? How do we make sure it's delivered by the person, again, trusted? 80%, this is across all groups, including the groups that you name specifically, 80% of people trust their healthcare provider to talk to them about their vaccines and healthcare. So how do we partner closely with those healthcare providers? We are doing that with a lot of the physician, nurse, allied health professional associations, that's key. But also we have to think about those influencers. I have three young kids, so I know a lot about influencers now, but who are those relevant influencers for the group that we're talking about? And how do we make sure we're in the right places in terms of media and other outlets? And so it's sort of that four prong strategy um, and that is already really embedded in the national public education campaign. 
So sorry, I talked a lot. <laughs> no, it's listen. This is really important. We've been talking about trust in in uh, uh, among groups, trust uh, of institutions. Uh, you know, but broad-based polling suggests that among the most highly trusted institutions uh, in America today is the business community. Um, and our co our COVID collaborative has uh, as esteemed uh, partners, the Business Roundtable, the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, the National Association of Manufacturers, as well as a number of individual uh, companies, um, really representing, if you think about them as employers, massive reach across the country. Um, can you talk a little bit about opportunities you see for us and for you to leverage those relationships to ensure um, uh, a, a, the most effective response to COVID overall um, and to getting folks uh, um, vaccinated. Wonderful, thank you. You know, I appreciate this opportunity to, to kind of, to thank also the, all the many partners in the business community, if ever, right? This is all hands, absolutely. And the business community has just stepped up um, many, many examples. And so grateful now to have a chance to, to speak to this. You know, the federal administration is already working. You, you named several, I think many members of the collaborative, but the Chamber of Commerce, also specifically like the National Manufacturers Association, like the list is, goes long, many um, uh, kind of business associations um, thinking specifically uh, about uh, business associations owned by people of color and other people from groups that have been really disproportionately affected. So already gathered kind of a, um, a really deep bench of business partners and they've all committed to uh, to doing three key things which is so important and so you know the first is hey let's make sure that we are keeping our our um, our employees safe that we're using the best practice in our in our businesses that's so important we see that those people who are essential workers on the front line also carrying higher, risk um, and so making sure that we have those practices in our own businesses for masking for social distancing for making that the the rule um, and then second making sure that businesses are amplifying the cdc messages to that point making that also the expectation for customers and clients uh, and then third which i really lean into and the partnerships there are great you know how do we think about how employers and businesses can remove some of those structural barriers. Like we were just talking about them a second ago, those things that keep people away from vaccine, even when they're at yes and they're eligible. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, we have, you know, Best Buy, Target, Dollar General, just to name a few, who are giving, you know, half a million employees paid time off right? Hmm. Like people need paid time off to go get vaccinated. Some are offering incentive to go get uh, vaccinated. So I think there's just a lot of innovation that is emerging from the business community. Um, and those are some of the strategies. And of course, you know, to take a, a, a step back, we've seen just some really um, historic partnerships form there. So if you think about something like J&J &J and Merck coming together to boost our vaccine supply, you know, just many, many, many examples of businesses stepping up um, and, uh, and contributing in such meaningful, important ways. That's wonderful. Good to hear. Just to follow up uh, on some of the boards that I'm serving on, that's exactly what the corporations are doing. They give the employee the entire day off paid to go get the shots needed and to take the family as well. So um, we, we know that it's suggested some states are doing better than others and getting shots into the arms and doing it equitably. So can you share with us what you're learning about best practices in the states? Mm -hmm. And are there any good examples of how the private or the nonprofit sectors have partnered with government to help increase access to and, and the uptake of vaccines? Thank you. Yes, yeah, so absolutely. You know, the, the CDC, so I will start off by saying, you know, we, 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 we talked a little bit about how the, um, our patchwork in terms of eligibility has affected some of the, the rollout. But, you know, some of the, 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 the patchwork there has led to great innovation as well. And that's some of what you're speaking to. As we see best promising practices emerging across states, how do we be, how are we sure that we're sharing sharing that, you know, the CDC hosted a few weeks back, just a great three-day forum in Vaccinate America. That was a big part of it was lifting up examples where people um, and places and jurisdictions are doing really well in terms of connecting people with vaccine in an equitable way and sharing some of those. You know, I'll um, start off by saying, 
from the federal government, you know, for the programs I mentioned before that are the federal channels, we're working hard to model what we think are best and promising practices there. And so, you know, again, we have mass vaccination sites, mobile clinics, we have a partnership with the retail pharmacies, both independent and chain, and partnerships directly with the community health centers. And all of those programs are actually expanding and growing, but they're all uh, anchored in equity. So one, we take a place-based approach to where we site the vaccination venues. That's necessary, but as everybody here knows, insufficient, but we have to make sure that it's in geographic proximity to the people who need it most. But then on top of that, we have to address the structural barriers. And so tools like, how do you think about registration, right? We all, I'm sure, have stories about people who've been trying to register and have been frustrated. Either they have low you know, uh, tech literacy, availability, the, the time, other things. So you have to make registration options a little more flexible, right? Having people walk up, for example, being able to call on the phone to make an appointment, mm -hmm. holding reservation slots for faith-based organizations, community-based organizations and others to book for people. You know, some of those are, are just really promising. Targeted geographic eligibility also. So holding some slots and saying, for some of these areas where we know have been hardest hit, we're going to hold a certain percentage. We're going to open registration, you know, a day earlier to people who live in those zip codes. Really critical. Um, can't lose sight, of course, of accessibility. Um, people with disabilities need to be able to access the site. People need to be able to communicate. So multiple languages, ASL, um, making sure we are thinking um, about our neighbors in that way as well. And then being flexible. You know, we just were talking about employers and business. We need you know, people need people to, to access vaccine on the weekend, in the evenings. So some 24 seven scheduling, weekend hours, some of those very pragmatic considerations. And then many of the states are also doing um, equity sort of base allocation and even incentivizing communities uh, through, through how they distribute and allocate the vaccine. So again, just really grateful. Oh, one last thing too, is to talk about um, uh, the, the need or, or not need for documentation around connecting with vaccines. We have to make sure there's not that barrier to people know the vaccine is free, you don't need to be insured. Um, that people also are aware, you know, you don't have to have a government issued ID, you don't have to prove citizenship. So all of those are many of the considerations that get us to the best and promising practices. And I, you know, I think it's just a tremendous opportunity as you started off by saying for states to share with one another what works well. Thank you very much. Doctor, we have a couple questions coming up from, uh, from our sponsors, um, and I get to present the first one uh, from Derek Johnson, who's the president and CEO of the NAACP. And he has a, a, a two-part uh, question having to do with the differences in what we read about the statistical effectiveness of the J&J &J vaccine on the one hand, single dose, right? Um, and the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines on the other hand, uh, two doses. And, um, and yet, uh, again, what we read indicates that the J&J &J option is tracking as the default option for working communities, low-income communities, communities of color, presumably because it's easier to handle, I don't know. Um, and, but does that imply that these communities are less worthy of having the more effective vaccines? The first question is about the, effective, the relative effectiveness and why are some communities getting the one versus the other? And then the next question really uh, builds on that. And that is given that so much of the data for tracking comes from local sources, county and state uh, sources, what are the mechanisms to assure we're getting good data so we can actually track what's happening? See, I did need to bring my pen. So uh -huh. President Johnson, I definitely <laughs> had to bring my pen. Got a three-parter there. Um, so that's fantastic. Thank you for that. I'll take them in turn. So, you know, the, the first around the, how the, the efficacy of mm -hmm. the three different vaccines that have been authorized for emergency use. I think it's so important. I'm really glad to be able to speak to this. You know, it's, it's, we can't compare them head to head. So let me just start by saying that they have different outcomes. They took place at different times with variants. We haven't even talked about variants yet, but when variants sort of weren't in circulation with Pfizer, Moderna or with the Johnson and Johnson Janssen product. So I really discourage people from trying to do head to head comparisons. Cause when you get down into the sort of nerdy granularity of it these are different trials in the ways they are constructed. What we do know is that 
for the things that we care about. So I'm, I might have to say it twice because when we talk about severe illness, hospitalization, and death, all three perform incredibly well. And so they're highly efficacious in keeping people alive. Say right? it and again. Yes, say it again. I'll have to say it again. Yeah. Because all three of the vaccines that are currently approved for emergency use work incredibly well at what matters most, and that's keeping people alive. And so that's what we need to anchor in. All right. And so that's the first point. You know, to, to this idea. And so, and because that is true, I say to everyone, you know, the best vaccine for you is the one that is available. A hundred percent, you know, that is the one. And I encourage people when that they're eligible and they can get an appointment that they take the vaccine that is available to them. And that is the best one for you. The vaccine that's best is the one you can get the soonest. And so, you know, we know even as, as uh, J and J came on board, you know, one of the things that I said often at the time is that, you know, we, and, and let me just take a step back. What the federal administration said is we think that all vaccines should be in all communities. And we expect states and local jurisdictions to allocate and distribute in that way. And we certainly from the federal administration are doing that and are tracking that. So I'm glad President Johnson raises that because we are paying attention um, and uh, to date have not seen any trends. We're seeing all vaccine go to all communities. Now that's different, right? Saying sort of all vaccines available in all communities is a little different than the reality that J&J &J brings flexibility for providers that we don't always have with Pfizer and Moderna. You know, we haven't talked about some of the cold chain, just some of the requirements for storage for Pfizer and Moderna that aren't there for J&J. &J. Um, and similarly, you know, the two dose versus one dose. So there's some situations where providers, healthcare providers might decide that one is better than the other. For instance, if you're doing like a pop-up clinic, um, sometimes for the mobile platforms. So there might be provider driven decisions. Mm -hmm. um, we also know there's individual choice. So I hear on both sides, you know, I, I hear folks who are just shopping around for J&J &J because they want that one shot, right? Mm -hmm. So again, I always say to people just, you know, I, we think it's important that you know what vaccine you're going to get when you show up. But again, all of them work incredibly well to keep people alive. And so I beg, beg, beg that people don't spend your time sort of shopping around for vaccines and instead take that very first appointment. All right, the third one, there's a third part to President Johnson's question, which is great, which is my favorite topic of all times, which is data um, and our need for it. You know, if we're gonna be data driven in our response and you know, how are we gonna know to target resources if we don't have the data? So this is core critical. The president signed executive, executive, multiple executive orders in his first full day, speaking to the need to increase the quality and completeness of, of our data in this area. I, I'm happy to report that, you know, if we take one variable, so such as um, race, ethnicity, we are actually seeing uh, progress. And, and thanks to, to many on the team, we've all been working hard collaboratively with states and providers to increase reporting. Um, and so we've seen that move from 50% now to 60%. We're very hopeful you know, for our federal vaccination channels. Again, trying to model what we think is best practice there, seeing incredibly high rates of completeness of, of those demographic data variables. So, you know, we can we continue to um, uh, to lift up the need for the data uh, and make sure, and again, it's it's about race as one, but also it's, you know, about geography. And so we, we need sort of many different data points in order to have a clear picture on, on equity in our country, but we haven't lost sight of, of that at all, making good progress there. Thank you. So we have another great question. This one is from Janet Merguia, and she's the president, the CEO of Unidos US. You probably know Janet. Uh, Unidos US partners with its affiliate network, their trusted voices, messengers working in health, immigration, housing, education, economic, empowerment, workforce development. So Janet is asking this question. How is the Biden administration working with local community-based organizations, such as those in the UNIDOS US network, in distressed communities to ensure equitable distribution and timely access to vaccines. Thank you so much. Um, a, a great, another great question. 
Uh, so you know, at the key of this is partnership. You know, so we talked a little bit early about trusted messengers in terms of answering people's questions and building confidence in the vaccine. These same trusted messengers are the primary partners for access. Um, and so, you know, thinking about even one of the examples I gave earlier, if you're going to kind of hold slots in your registration, you know, sort of queue for community-based organizations, faith-based organizations to be able to enroll their clients, their members, their congregants, right? That is a key partnership that can be there. Also to cite vaccination venues, some of the most successful, I'm sure people are aware, some of the most successful activities, particularly in these communities that have been hardest hit have been these partnerships between community-based organizations that say, we're gonna do a pop-up here this weekend, right? We're gonna have vaccine available in a venue that you know, in a venue that you trust and people who you know and trust will be there. Um, and so that is just one of the most effective strategies. You know, even you referenced earlier, I had a great opportunity in partnership with one of our community health centers um, here in Connecticut, Fairhaven Community Care, as well as community activists and many, many community-based organizations to go door to door um, knocking on doors and getting people registered for vaccine, but seeing those familiar faces, kind of people they knew, really opened up that conversation and ultimately ended up connecting people with vaccine. I want to make this important point, which is that the administration knows that CBOs need resources to do this work. You know, CDC has already um, made several grants and has announced recently um, $3 billion in funding that will go to states but requiring partnership with CBOs and other partners. That is what we require for our federal channels is partnership on the ground with CBOs. You know, recently the, uh, the vice president announced $250 million in grant funding that's available through the Department of Health and Human Services. Again, really about making sure that community partners are there at the table when we're talking about vaccine, but also all the mitigation strategies, mask, PPE, testing therapies. Um, so knowing that that's the strategy that works, we have to do it. That's, you know, even in my work as a researcher, when um, I talk about community academic partnership, it's, it's, it's not something that we do in the research team because it's nice to do. It's because it always makes the work better. And partnering with community-based organizations will always make the work better. Good, thank you. Great. Um, another great question from another important partner of ours, Dr. Yvette Robideau of the National Congress of American Indians. And she asks, uh, what is the administration doing to address uh, inequity in access to vaccine appointments across the United States? So uh, just being able to get an appointment. Yes. Does the membership of the COVID-19 Health Equity Task Force reflect the diversity of the country and can the general public listen into and provide input to the meetings of the COVID-19 Health Equity Task Force? Thank you. Another wonderful question and, um, and great to, to have the co-host, just I count them all among uh, close colleagues. So, you know, absolutely, inequity and appointment. So let's lean in there because we've already talked about creating vaccination venues and opportunities for people to sort of, you know, be able to get vaccinated somewhere close and convenient, but you have to be able to make an appointment. Um, we've talked about some of the strategies, but importantly, you know, the president announced that there will be um, a centralized website where people can go, you know, as we know, May, May first fast approaches. Uh, he's made a call to kind of governors to open up eligibility. So we, we know people will need kind of all that back infrastructure there to make their appointments. Mm -hmm. But also, you know, there is a call center that will be part of that rollout at the federal level. Um, just speaking to, again, you know, we all come at this process with different, with access to different tools, um, access to different experience with working with internet and these platforms. We'll continue to elevate the need for people to have other options, as we've talked about, walk-up options, um, and again, many of these, the practices at the federal channels. And I think that's one of the ways that we are making sure people can get appointments is we're boosting supply. We're also expanding the federal channels. You know, we're expanding to 20,000 pharmacies across the country, over 950 community health centers on the way to 1400 community health centers and lookalikes. Excellent. Yes, we're looking at other programs too. And of course the mass vaccination sites and the mobile clinics that are out there. So making sure that the supply is there, that the venues are there and that people have multiple, multiple ways to make an appointment. That's gonna be key. Um, okay, I took my notes. The second one was a oh, task force <laughs> membership. So the membership of the task force. So we, you know, I'm so um, excited to have a moment to talk about the task force. And 
Um, the health equity, the COVID-19 Health Equity Task Force has brought together um, 12 outside US government members, each one just tremendous, bringing lived expertise or lived experience, sorry, and expertise specific to many of the groups that have been hardest hit. Um, certainly, we are very grateful for the diversity and perspectives that are brought to bear in that group, um, and they heal from all across the country. Um, but we want everybody to see themselves in this work. And so there are multiple ways to contribute to the process, even if one is in a sitting member of the, the task force. So I made mention already to the ongoing stakeholder roundtables we're having, those are incredibly valuable. We have these intimate conversations, really about 30 people at a time, bringing up perspectives, ideas, recommendations, pragmatic solutions. Um, and we're able to take our time and sort of go deep and follow up with people as well. So that's just critically important, as well as public comment, right? And so the, every meeting is, is publicly facing. So I think that was part of the question. Our next, right on time too, because our next meeting is this Friday, March 26th from 12 to three Eastern standard. And so um, those are all publicly facing. Everybody is welcome to join and watch us in our deliberations. Um, and there's also the opportunity to submit public comment. Public comment can be submitted kind of ahead of the meeting and people join and share their public comment. But even after the meeting, like for this coming meeting, any public comment submitted by April 1st, written public comment will be added into the, into the minutes. So we really invite people to submit the public comment to be part of the meeting in that way and sharing the public comments. Um, and certainly just again, because the meeting date may have passed, there's still time, the April 1st deadline for this coming month. This meeting on Friday, we're gonna focus on equitable vaccine access and acceptance. And so just really um, uh, looking forward to that conversation and uh, and proposing some interim recommendations on that. We topic. will, thank you for that. It, maybe we'll get from you how people can uh, join that, uh, that meeting, the one coming up on Friday, for example, and get that out to the some 600 people who are participating in this conversation right now. Thank you. Thank you. We certainly will. Um, you know, if you just search and you're, we'll get that out, but if you just search for the COVID-19 Health Equity Task Force, we're grateful to the Department of Health and Human Services and the Office for Minority Health for hosting us. It'll take you to that website, to that homepage, and then there'll be the, the link there for how to Perfect. submit public comment and how to join them. Perfect. Thank you. So doctor, um, we do, we have hundreds of people throughout the United States, about a thousand watching this, listening closely to your question. So we're now going to go to questions from that audience. And here's a really, uh, a very astute question. Uh, what blind spots do you think policymakers at the local state federal level might have and might need to proactively address when serving communities of color? What are the blind spots? Yeah, great question. And, um, and true that I think the blind spots can exist at all the levels. And you know, this is one of the reasons why we try to work so collaboratively and so closely, because what you're hoping for is that the blind spots are different. So that in conversation and collaboration, you will address them all. I mean, I think some of the ones are things that we've um, sort of spoken to already. I think the presumption that um, sort of the vaccination location, the venue alone is gonna be sufficient to connect people with vaccine. And I think that, you know, everybody is doing very rapid learning and keeping that flexibility to pivot. But again, understanding the need to address all those structural barriers. You know, we haven't really even talked a lot about transportation, but it goes back to even the pharmacy deserts piece that you brought up. Right. You know, and so we see, I mean, I think it's great. This is also to tie into the question about businesses. We see Uber and Lyft have, they have a partnership with Walgreens, for example. I think it's about 10 to 15 million rides, if I have that number right, um, that they are bringing to the process. So being really intentional about each of those structural barriers. I think has been a potential blind spot where it's sort of like, here we have this in a neighborhood or community, but perhaps we haven't worked as closely with those community-based organizations as we need to, to do outreach and engagement. You know, perhaps we really haven't thought about the scheduling and the hours um, and what will work for people's schedules. Maybe we haven't thought through all those registration challenges sufficiently. Um, 
So hopefully, you know, all we can ever, in work like this, what you want is for the quick reveal. And so I think that's what we're always hopeful for is that we won't get too far into any particular process um, before recognizing it might be, you know, might not be the right one and then being able to quickly pivot. It's a great question. And could I just tag on to that? Yeah, please. If you come from the medical world. You're now right in the middle of government. What is one of the biggest surprises you didn't expect mm. that may be a positive, but also the one that is a negative? Mm. That's great. You know, now you're making me wish that I journal. I always say this. I was like, every day I should be writing down a couple <laughs> sentences about this experience so that I can answer these kinds of questions. You know, I think it's right. It's true. I, you know, I had the great uh, pleasure of, of serving at the request of the governor of my, uh, of my state, uh, Connecticut, on the reopen process there, um, worked with amazing uh, sort of uh, committee uh, around thinking through populations that are, are vulnerable to COVID-19 and, and then perhaps started having some insights, at least at the state level, about government and now have this window for the federal government. You know, I think there is, what I would probably say is, um, I am impressed. So I'm an academic. And so, you know, we are typically, um, we're not known for speed. <laughs> and so I think that one of the things that I've, that I've noted, and perhaps it's a, it's a flip, is that some things we can move on just incredibly quickly, like being able to bring all the resources of the federal government to bear, you know, being able to stand up those multiple and, and everything, equity is a team sport, right? So this is the collective, but being able to stand up, you know, all those different federal vaccination channels within three weeks. Um, wow, right, the speed of the federal uh, administration. But there's some things that also you think could go quicker. <laughs> and so it is like this learning of where in government things can move really quickly and then and where perhaps they cannot, right? And I think, you know, even hearkening back to something like that data question, I think I'm, I've learned a lot around you know just all the technical pieces and intricacies of kind of why and how and, and it becomes a very hyper local process talking to individual jurisdictions individual providers around you know what is happening with your data system what's happening with data collection and reporting so even as we speak to the need to educate people on giving us the demographic data we need and we know that's important we also have to have conversations about like interoperability of data systems and sort of you know some of that data architecture so just understanding some things that can be turned on and off with a switch and other things that are just you know, going to be more like a dimmer. Mm. So interesting. We we have a, a, a couple of questions from uh, our audience, our participants today, about uh, intersecting pandemics, the pandemic of COVID-19 and the pandemic of racism. Um, one question in particular about uh, the, the, the hate expressed um, in the news recently about uh, toward Asian American Pacific Island uh, citizens. Um, how has the Health Equity Task Force addressed that and thought about that? And the other more broadly about um, what you've been doing to advocate within the Biden administration uh, to begin to think about and address racism as its own public health crisis. Yeah, great, thank you. And um, as for many, I know my heart is heavy for what happened in Atlanta, for everyone who loses a loved one to violence, um, often that's hate fueled, right? And and I think um, you know, and I, I can be sad sometimes for us as a as a nation. Um, but the truth now is, we're having a lot of conversations that are long overdue, right? And we're perhaps reckoning and grappling um, with issues of racism in a way uh, perhaps that we haven't before. And so it's critical that we meet the moment as we think about policy um, and, uh, and, and lean in heavily, right? In solidarity with all of those who are affected. You know, the task force, um, so importantly, the, the president signed a memorandum again in early days of his administration, speaking specifically to the need to address anti-Asian sentiment and xenophobia. And as a task force, we do not take it lightly that we've been asked to make uh, recommendations and speak to um, what was in that memo, specifically around the federal government's response to COVID-19 
And so that's work that is that we're doing that will be, that's always part of our conversation, will be part of our conversation at Friday's meeting. And so, you know, we see all across the country, several jurisdictions, states and others have declared racism a public health crisis. And you know, to be clear, I mean, racial justice is one of the pillars of President Biden, Vice President Harris's entire administration. So, you know, I'm happy to be here as, you know, one person um, holding one uh, scope of work and activity, but it's not singular, right? This is, a, this is anchoring and centering across everywhere uh, in the entire administration. And so how do we advance on racial justice? And this is work that we are sprinting on. We are also marathoning on, right? We have to be doing both at the same time, but shared value, shared priority. Uh, and so, you know, as I said, we're holding into that. You know, I, I had the good fortune of having a, um, a conversation with um, Asian American, Native Hawaiian and Pacific Islander stakeholder group um, uh, earlier on in the week before the Atlanta tragedy. And again, it's important that we listen. That's one of the things I took away from that conversation is how important it is to just sometimes to be quiet, to be silent, to listen to the communities that are affected because they have the answers. Thank you. So doctor, our last audience question is gonna close on a more personal note. Uh, and it's about you, Marcella Nunez Smith. You're on the faculty at Yale. You're a practicing physician leader of this important task force for the administration. What do you do to step back and recharge for all that you're doing? Thank you. I am grateful for a well-being question and reminder, right, <laughs> of how critical that is. Um, and, and thank you. You know, it is, this is the deepest personal and professional honor to be um, to be at these tables. Uh, I do not take it lightly at all. And so I do think it's right to, to have this idea. You know, I'm a parent as well. That wasn't in your, your list and a daughter and a spouse and a friend. And so a lot of where I find my energy is in connecting with those loved ones. You know, I'm grateful to my family. They are very funny people and no one here takes me seriously at all, <laughs> which I love. And so it's always a great recharge to be in connection with family um, and getting out into, into nature and space uh, is so important. But also, you know, finding these moments for mission. You know, when we talked before, it, being able to be part of that just um, grassroots canvassing campaign that just was knocking on doors, you know, that actually was wonderful. It was energizing because it was a moment for mission. It reminds us all why we are in this. Um, and so that I think is incredibly important. So finding opportunities just to stay connected, not just with my family, but with community, I, I find that so, so important. And then try to get a spin class in every once in a while. Beautiful. <laughs> Beautiful. Yes, indeed. Well, I wanna thank you so much, Dr. Nunez Smith for joining us today. I wanna thank our audience for your engagement. Hundreds of you made the transition smoothly from one platform to the other and we're having technical difficulties at the beginning and we thank you for hanging uh, with us. Dr. Nunez Smith, I just give the floor to you for a few closing thoughts. Oh my goodness, thank you so much. I only want to take one second to say thank you. You know, thank you to the COVID Collaborative. Thank you to all the co-hosts. Thank you to everyone, of course, to our fantastic moderators. You were very patient with me. Thank you so much for that, you know, and for what everybody is doing. We are so close, right? Hope is here. Um, we see increasing supply. Vaccines are the way that we're going to get to the other side of this. We have to hold what we know to be true a little bit longer with the mask, the physical distancing. Um, but, you know, we're going to reclaim our joy. We're going to be able to gather again. We're going to have our family reunions. We're going to gather together for worship. You know, we're gonna to go to sporting events together again. Our kids will be in school and our businesses will be open. And so it is with optimism that I wanna leave us today. And just thank you, thank you everybody for all you're doing. Well, we, we appreciate you closing on optimism and we embrace that and we support that. Um, and I too wanna to thank our co-hosts, the NAACP, Unidos US, the National Congress of American Indians, for this fireside chat with uh, a, a real fine American medical leader, um, someone who's a great role model. And you have uh, 
represented the administration with class and dignity today and with good data. We appreciate that greatly. Um, I had texted uh, a message that I'd received from John Bridge this morning that 13 leading sports leagues and Willie Nelson joined It's Up to You campaign. And I'd sent this to friends and to my family. And I, I'd gotten this note while we're on this, this nice chat from my daughter. And she says, awesome, exclamation point. Uh, she says, when is your vaccine appointment, Mr. Co-Chair? So <laughs> I say to our daughter, Heather, I'm working on it. Uh, <laughs> <no. laughs> but, um, and, and I would just like to do this as well. And to say uh, on a personal note, what a pleasure it is for me to work with Deval Patrick. Mm -hmm. I think we demonstrate that a Republican and a Democrat in America today can truly be friends and do things that are positive for the benefit of the greater cause. So may, may we all continue to look for the united in the United States. Bless right you. back at you, my friend. Thank you so much. And thank you, thank everyone, you for joining. Yeah, thank you all. And doctor, keep up.